Is that better, everybody at home? Yeah, perfect. Okay, sorry about that. Yes. No, it doesn't. So the question was for everybody at home, does uh, this kind of include like AAU basketball? No. These, uh, these types of programs that we're talking about today are high school and middle school sports, more or less. Good question. Okay, so with the, with the amount of scope, for the, the size of high school sports, okay, or school-based sports. States and different communities were starting to put together ways to, to help one another, kind of problem solve, okay? So that's kind of how the, uh, you know, coaches associations or, you know, sporting associations um, started to, to come about, okay? In uh, the, uh, I think, what, 1921, it says there, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, and Wisconsin were some of the first, were some of the first states to kind of come together and kind of create a regional-based, you know, school coaches association to help, you know, navigate some of the problems that they were having, okay? How are they, you know, handling eligibility issues? How are they managing, um, you know, creative ways to, you know, manage scheduling conflicts, okay? Whatever it was, they thought it was a good idea to, you know, kind of pull, pull their resources together, you know, meet on a regular basis and kind of navigate some of those questions that they were having, okay? And then certainly um, later down the line, a couple years later, that idea really caught on and more and more, you know, states are starting to do that. Okay, and I think by 1923, most, uh, most states had some type of, um, you know, over, overseeing body to, uh, to, help, uh, to help with, uh, you know, answering, you know, questions and just kind of pooling resources. Okay, here's some more examples, okay. The Fl uh, Florida High School Athletic Association, I think, I forget the exact figure, but uh, I'm pretty sure there's, I think, over a thousand different high schools down there is a, a part of that one. Okay, and then you have the University Interscholastic League. That is one of the, uh, the largest uh, organizations in the world to help, um, you know, help schools kind of put together, um, you know, resources and come up with uh, different governing body, you know, rules and regulations and, and everything like that, okay? Nothing super important on this slide, just a couple of examples. Okay, this is a very short chapter, so probably another 30, 40 minutes or so at the most, okay? <laughs> Okay, of course, being, uh, you know, certainly being a coach and, uh, you know, for most of us since we're athletes and, you know, have been around athletics for a long time, okay, you kind of bump into the idea of, you know, how does my athletic experience kind of enrich or enhance my academic experience, okay? There's research that says, you know, that there is a correlation, right? That, uh, researchers have found that uh, grade point averages are higher, you know, for athletes when they're in season, right? Okay, I'm sure, I'm sure we've all, you know, kind of heard about that or have, you know, done some reading or, you know, written a paper or something like that on, on that topic. Okay, you know, so certainly being able to, you know, manage your time and, you know, make sure you're accomplishing everything that you're needing to based on your academic schedule, of course, okay? Sports is just in inherently educational, right? So being able to learn new skills, okay? Being able to work with others, you know, developing those interpersonal skills, um, you know, within, within your individual toolbox to be able to help, um, you know, just develop you as a person, okay? 
And then, of course, foster success later in life, just developing that work ethic, developing good habits, um, you know, things that, um, you know, are just really good life, but life skills to have as, uh, as you move forward through, um, through your life. Okay. Of course, with uh, all of those benefits, you have people that, you know, think that, you know, sports are, you know, distracting to young people. They're not able to, you know, really focus on, uh, focus on their academic work and, uh, you know, different things like that. Okay. You're always going to have multiple, um, multiple viewpoints of, uh, of things, but overall, I think you know a lot of us have had really uh, impactful experiences as a result of our you know athletic you know experiences. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Wait, you're saying that when they're in season, they have a higher GPA? Yeah. Do you know why that might be? I mean, it seems like it should be kind of the opposite, right? Yeah, so good. for everybody at home, the question was, why exactly do um, student athletes tend to have a higher grade point average when they're actually in season compared to, you know, kind of their not non traditional season or out of season? And I think a lot of it is one, just people are inherently um, more motivated and engaged when you're actually busy, right? So if you have if you have, um, you know, practice, you know, games two, three times a week on top of, you know, all of your homework for your four classes, right? That's not a whole lot of time where you're just able to sit back in the dorm and play video games or whatever else you do, right? So really kind of having that um, structured, structured environment where you're able to kind of tackle everything that's in your agenda book or, you know, on your phone agenda or your checklist, whatever. I think that is one of the big reasons why, um, you know, it's kind of supporting the, um, the grade point averages a little bit higher when, uh, when you're in season. So good for you track athletes and you're always busy. Right? Yeah. So, so there's no, it's like, well, like, like a charter window when you have like your, your free time, it's just like, like, like when you have like your free time, like, <coughs> like you want to kind of engage like you would be in a kind of like a weird yeah. school. Or something. Yep. Before you know it, it's just like time to go to, Sleep, you know, sleep and, like, you know, wake up all the time. Yeah, exactly. And I think, you know, certainly during during COVID, I know for me, it's um, it's been more so kind of back in March, April, and May time frame when the pandemic was first starting that, you know, it was just kind of hard to really kind of establish a new rhythm and routine because typically during that time, you know, I'm traveling every weekend, you know, going to recruiting events, and I was planning for practice and getting ready for my matron class, PE 100. Well, all that was kind of taken away from me. So it was like, I have a lot of extra free time. You know, what the heck am I going to be able to do with it? And, you know, of course, we, uh, I think now that we uh, we're kind of turning out of the depths of the pandemic, um, you know, fingers crossed, knock on wood, that uh, that's going to continue to be the case. But I think we all can kind of relate back to, uh, to that time where it was just kind of a little bit more difficult to, you know, stay focused and, um, you know, be productive during that time. Discipline. So, like, we say yeah. that people are more likely to be disciplined when they're in season rather than out of season. Is that what? More or less, yes. I think, like, especially I and I can only uh, kind of talk about my my individual, you know, experience about that. But um, I think when when I am in season, you know, during the fall, so much of my day is like already planned for me, you know? So like for me, I, uh, I'm into Ironman triathlon. Okay. So I, I have two races coming up this summer. And when, when my day is completely planned from, you know, more or less two o'clock through seven o'clock with practices, team meetings, all that stuff, you know, when am I going to be able to fit my own individual training in? Well, that means I'm going to have to get up and swim before work, maybe get a run in during lunch or something like that, where, you know, it's, it's going to be pretty similar for you when, you know, if you have, you know, practice at the end of the day and you have class up until, you know, noon, one, one o'clock, when are you going to try and fit your homework in? Because you're going to have to get to bed early because, you know, maybe you have a 6 a.m. lift, you know, the next day or something like that. So 
just being able to, you know, time management and kind of forming that type of question. So, good question. So, uh, participation numbers, okay, there's a lot of data out there to, uh, to be able to, you know, kind of talk through and support just how big uh, the, you know, inner school or school sports market is. And this isn't including college sports, okay, this is only kind of high school, um, you know, secondary uh, education level. So, certainly the impacts of Title IX, okay, we've all, you know, heard about Title IX within the sports industry. Okay, there's a lot of different, you know, aspects with Title IX. Okay, but one of the big, one of the big components of Title IX was, uh, you know, tackling the issue of, you know, gender discrimination within participation opportunities. Right. So, um, you know, in '72, uh, yeah, 1972 was when Title IX came out. There weren't necessarily as many opportunities for young girls and young women. To be able to participate in sports. Okay. After the passing of that bill, after the passing of that bill, more and more, you know, schools are starting to add uh, different programs that they were offering. Okay. And as a result of that, okay, numbers have consistently increased. I think there's a chart in our book. Um, I can't exactly remember which page it's on. I think uh, page 151, where it just kind of goes through the uh, the total number, or I guess the, uh, as accurate of an estimate as possible. Okay, through the years from '72 all the way up to I think 2017 uh, or 2018, whenever this book was uh, kind of published. The number of participating boys and girls have gone up drastically since um, since the passing of that bill. Okay, I think um, now in 2017 there are 3.4 million female athletes across the country, and then for boys it was 4.5 million total student athletes competing. Okay, so certainly in, in 72, there were about 300,000 females competing at the high school level. So you can kind of see the, uh, the amount of interest and the amount of opportunities that have, uh, have come through. Um, that have come through since, uh, since the title, uh, title line passage. Okay. Um, states with the most popular, or excuse me, the most participants, okay, uh, that would be Texas, okay, state of Texas with 810,000 athletes, okay, those are young, uh, those are boys, okay, so the state of Texas has the most male participants, okay, and the state of California has the most female participants. Okay, 800,000 young females in the state of California are participating. Okay, most popular sports. Okay, these uh, I'm, I'm sure aren't very surprising. Within uh, within the uh, the girls sector sector of um, of sports, basketball, track, cross country. Volleyball, tennis, golf, soccer, swim, cheerleading. Okay. Boys, very similar. Basketball, soccer, football, track, cross country, swimming, golf, wrestling, baseball, of course. Okay. Not, uh, not reinventing the wheel there. It's fairly interesting when, uh, when you start to tackle some of the, uh, some of the hard, uh, hard data associated with, uh, with some of these uh, uh, trends, we'll say. Okay. So whenever you're talking about, and this is kind of goes back to the um, a couple chapters ago. Uh, just kind of talking about the organizational leadership 
um, and management structures, okay? There's no right or wrong way to, you know, set up an organization, okay? Each, each situation, every scenario is a little bit different. So what may work for one area may not necessarily work with another, okay? But we'll be able to kind of talk through some of these, okay? So considerations for structuring different, uh, you know, management systems, okay? Or within uh, athletic departments, okay? Some things to consider. One, size of the school district, right? So where I went to, where I went to high school, okay, out in Virginia, Virginia Beach, we had 10 different high schools in our district that, alone okay i graduated with about 625 other kids in my class so there is over you know 20 2500 kids in my high school okay so that organization that organizational structure may be very very different than what it is here in waverly right where there's only one high school within this district okay or maybe two i think jamesville has a separate district maybe i don't know for any local people um, centralized versus decentralized, okay? Centralized, okay? This is a very um, vertical-driven um, organizational structure, right? So maybe you have the superintendent of, uh, superintendent of a school and, or excuse me, uh, superintendent of the school district followed by a, uh, you know, principal or two, maybe a couple of administrators within the school. You have the athletic director, um you know administrators and then maybe a junior high affiliated with it okay it's all very vertical decentralized okay it's very kind of spread out okay where there's kind of a lot of wiggle room within this okay uh, i think on the next slide uh there's a chart that i'm looking at in the textbook okay that kind of focuses on that Okay, but there's more moving parts to it in a decentralized organizational structure. Okay, you really kind of have to promote working together and asking and finding solutions among, uh, you know, different different people within the organization that help solve problems. Okay. Couple other things to consider. One, how the uh, the type of you know setup at your individual school. Okay, do you, is it a public institution? Is it a private institution? Right, in a private school setting, you know, administrators and you know that school district is you know able to kind of do things however they you know want more or less. Um, you know, there's just a little bit more wriggle wiggle room and less, uh, you know, less mandates or less structure to, to be able to, open their head, I'm sorry. Um, and then it's, of course, athletic budgets. Okay, that's something else to consider. If, if you have a really well-funded, uh, you know, private school where, you know, most of their money and most of their budget is coming through, you know, donations and whatnot, that may be really different compared to a high school that I went to where, you know, money is trying to be filtered and sorted through, you know, seven or eight different athletic programs, right? Which is very, very different. Um, you know, once again, no right or wrong way to, about it, just circumstances are different. And this is the chart that I was referencing. That's on, I think, page 153 or something. So you can kind of see how vertical everything is and here, you know, it seems like almost all of these, uh, all of these different boxes, all of these different, you know, department heads are, you know, able to kind of work, work within one another. Okay, so important to kind of understand and reference. Okay, of course, talking through, you know, different career opportunities within, within, uh, you know, high school sports. Okay, you have executive director chief financial officer being able to you know manage where the budget's going who who's going to you know which athletic program is going to need more funding you know football for example may be uh, you know needing more you know more of a budget than golf or something like that just with total number of participants okay 
Director of Media Relations and Marketing, of course, you know, being able to have the division within uh, within a department to be able to communicate, you know, different things, new mandates, especially with COVID. You know, for example, here in uh, Wartburg, Trent Jackson is our Sport Information Director. Okay, so I would kind of throw him within, uh, uh, you know, this type of media relations and marketing role, you know, coming up with, you know, graphics for social media, being able to post uh, schedule updates. Let's say, um, you know, we're supposed to be hosting a track meet here this weekend at the conference level, okay? Maybe, you know, something happens and we have to start on Saturday compared to Friday or something like that, okay? That would come from this office. Membership services, that would be Sheila Kittleson down, uh, downstairs here in the W. Okay, she's like a, a, a Sheila and Steve Walker are like facility administrators. Okay, being able to help manage, um, you know, facilities because our athletic director, who would be, you know, we'll say the executive director probably isn't, um, you know, necessarily going to want to handle facility type related issues. Okay, so that's just a very simple, um, you know, kind of a um, very simple breakout or breakdown of some of these uh, different positions. Okay, and I think on this next slide, we'll be able to kind of talk through a little bit more. So once again, in an individual athletic department, okay, this is kind of some of the, uh, um, you know, hierarchy within, um, within a group. So of course, you have the athletic director, that's usually kind of the most senior person um, that's able to, you know, talk with, you know, maybe the principal, okay, maybe, you know, the football team is going off to, you know, we'll just say the state tournament, something like that, and maybe they were going to, you know, cancel class that day, so, you know, a, a section, uh, you know, of the student body could go and support the team, you know, that would be a conversation where the athletic director, you know, has to talk with the coach, the coach talks with the AD, the AD talks with the school president, maybe they have to get that approved, you know, from the superintendent or something like that. So you kind of see that relationship. Okay, once again, associate or assistant ADs. Okay, we'll stick with that word for example that I gave you in the last one. Okay, Steve Walker, Sheila Kittleson. Okay, those are facility athletic, or athletic directors, but they kind of concentrate on the W side of things. Okay, the building that we're in here. Okay, you don't want, uh, you definitely don't want the athletic director having to figure out what time track practicing, what time football practicing, and then when soccer is, you know, coming in behind them. Okay, especially during COVID, um, I think the more the more organized we're all able to be, of course, the the better everything's going to roll. Okay, athletics business manager, I would say that's probably Kathy in the in the front office there. Okay, being able to kind of help help coaches, help athletic administrators kind of bridge that gap where, you know, maybe, uh, you know, we'll say, you know, uh, coach, um, coach Willis, uh, you know, has a meeting with some of the, you know, chancellors or administrators here on campus, and he needs some help facilitating, you know, whatever else. Kathy would be an excellent person to go to. Okay, so you kind of see the different levels within um within everything coaches of course okay obviously very important within an athletic department helping our athletes athletic trainers as well okay that's a massive massive aspect and i think you know certainly at the uh, at the high school level okay maybe not necessarily every athletic or maybe uh maybe every school may not have an athletic trainer okay i know uh, you know, just as I've talked with kids during the recruiting process, you know, sometimes there's only, you know, one contracted person that's only on campus from, you know, three to five o'clock and they're bouncing between six or seven practices at once, you know, so that, um, that's something to think about as well. And then officials, okay, that may be, uh, uh, going back to the athletic business manager, that may be an area that, uh, it kind of falls under that category, okay? You know, making sure that, you know, referees and officials are showing up to, you know, or scheduled for matches and games, okay? So certainly a lot of different, um, 
you know, roles within within an athletic part uh, department. And of course, these are very, you know, similar to, you know, college level as well. I just figured stick with uh, with what we know. Okay, issues and relevant topics within, uh, you know, the sports in general, let alone high school sports. Okay, so one concussion incidents. Okay, you know the the. Concussions are incredibly relevant, you know, certainly with, uh, you know, a lot of the data and a lot of the, um, you know, publicity that the NFL is getting since they're, you know, actively researching this stuff, how to make, you know, the game safer, how to make our athletes safer. Okay. And it's, it's especially at this level, it's quite complicated because we're not talking about, uh, you know, adults, right? Most everybody you know, maybe, you know, by the time you're a senior, maybe you're 18, but for the most part, talking with, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds, that's kind of, you know, a little bit of uh, a tricky situation. Okay. You know, trying to make sure that you're taking care of all of, uh, you know, everybody within your, you know, athletic programs, all your teams, everything like that, and just making sure that they're you know, they have the resources to be able to, you know, help with uh, with concussion protocols and different things like that. Okay, the next one. Not every place is going to have experienced administrators to be able to help with that. Okay, there's, especially at this level, you may have to you know, wear multiple hats, okay? You know, maybe you are an experienced teacher in the building, okay? And maybe, you know, you, maybe Chris here is really experienced in track and cross country, you know, because that's what he did in college and now he's a teacher in the math department or whatever, but, you know, maybe the tennis coach had to, you know, step away for a season and now he's taking on the tennis program. Okay, there's maybe a, not, to, may not be able to, you know, kind of have a lot of organization within that to help a ton of different people. Okay, but, you know, it's kind of all hands on deck, especially at this level, if that makes sense. Budgetary constraints, you know, certainly with, uh, within public schools because uh, you know, property taxes kind of help in with school budgets. Okay, so you know, before the housing crisis in 2008 or 2009, I think, um, you know, certainly, you know, things were really good. So there was, you know, a little bit larger of budgets. Okay, but then after the housing crisis, uh, you know, of course, property taxes, you know, changed. The, um, you know, different properties have become neglected, and that drives the overall taxes down and that means less money in the athletic departments okay so you can kind of see how that is certainly tied uh, tied between that and because because of this you know certainly and it's not just limited to athletics right more more and more schools are you know having to pinch pennies in you know maybe the theater department on on a high school you know campus or you know music or athletics whatever it is so you can certainly kind of see, you know, how important and how relevant, you know, that budgetary uh, aspect of sports is, okay? And then of course, co uh, coaching turnover, okay? Going back to that example I used with Chris here, okay? Seems like, you know, every school has teachers or administrators that are constantly leaving or retiring for whatever reason. So as a result of that, you know, some people may have played for, you know, one or two coaches during, you know, their course of their sporting career in their high school, right? That, uh, that's certainly really, uh, really relevant and a, a challenge because you're always trying to find, you know, that, uh, that next person to fill that job. But that's where, you know, there's certainly going to be some opportunities for people, you know, our age that are, you know, relatively fresh out of school that, you know, maybe played uh, uh, you know, college sports or, you know, worked in camps or, you know, has a really good background within it where you're going to be able to find some pretty cool, unique opportunities if, you know, if you take the time to be able to research and find them and, you know, invest the time to build those connections, of course. Okay, and then, of course, the uh, going back to the officials aspect of it, 
Um, that's one job that I wouldn't like, you know, just being an official, but um, of course it's, it's a very important aspect, but being able to find and locate those people that are willing to help out in referee games and, you know, manage, uh, manage coaches and administrators and helping, helping to fill that need as well. Okay, so those, I think the book goes through more, more examples, but those are some of the uh, kind of the larger ones that I think are especially relevant. Okay, last couple slides here, and then um, and then we're done. Okay, it's about an hour today. Um, so we did. Oh, okay. So they did. Uh, they did give additional issues. So you know, being able to have kind of that fair play, making sure that everybody in the school is going to be able to have. Um, you know, an equal opportunity to go out for a team, you know, especially I know for where I went to high school, okay, we had, you know, maybe 65 kids come out for varsity and JV, okay, we didn't have enough interest, um, you know, being able to, you know, have like a sophomore and, you know, maybe JV one or JV two. But talking with some of the kids, um, you know, that I recruited out of, you know, like Valley or Waukee in Des Moines, you know, they have, you know, over 100 kids coming out for sports. And I'm not, I'm just sticking with soccer as an example, but being able to, you know, come up with a solution where, hey, maybe you're able to find three or four different coaches to be able to coach three or four different teams. That's an easy solution. Okay, but coming up with, you know, ideas like that to be able to help transfers. Okay, that's uh, especially when you get into, you know, private schools, that can be a little bit tricky, right? When, you know, if, if they're living in, you know, the west side of town, but they're going to a private school on the east side of town, they're not necessarily zoned for it, but that family is okay with being able to, you know, spend 10000 a year for high school education or whatever, you know, that's, uh, that's something else. You know, the parents aspect of it, you know, being able to, you know, manage, you know, kind of the, um, uh, the words eluding me, but being able to navigate some of those political, you know, issues that you have within, you know, really competitive sports programs, okay? If, if you talk to every athletic administrator, at some point, they're going to mention, you know, they're receiving emails or, you know, whatever else, okay? And then, of course, the media aspect, you know, it seems especially at the, you know, top, top level when you have kids that, you know, are playing for high school that, you know, are going to play, you know, college basketball at Duke or football at Iowa, you know, or Clemson, whatever. When those athletes are competing, of course, you're going to have all the media attention that goes along with it. So, you know, are you going to allow those, um, you know, members of the press to come in and interview them during his lunch hour? Or something like that. So a couple uh, a couple things to consider. Again, academics relates like the like the transfer part, but like uh, like school that I attended, like uh, we we even had like kids like from like different counties to play for us. Yeah. So, like we, we were in private school, so like we were right. able to do that. Yeah. yeah. I uh, and you know, unfortunately, there's no when especially when you're talking about transfers. And you know, public schools, private schools, there's no there's no real playbook, you know, that you have in front of you to help kind of guide you with uh, with that. Now, you know, and maybe that's uh, that's another you know really good opportunity to be able to ask some other administrators and you know some of those you know coaches associations or you know governing bodies, um, you know, especially if you're you know first time athletic director that's been in the job maybe a year or two. You're not going to have as much experience that you know Jack may have, who's been in that role as an AD at another private school for you know 10, 15, 20 years, whatever. So very interesting, and I'm sure there's probably books that you can read um, on that type of stuff. But uh, yeah, that is practical applications. Just some other things to uh, um, you know think about or additional research. That you can uh, you can do, and then review questions. Okay. So no 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 no